everybody. Welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome everyone. This is episode number 109 of Warbird Tube. And tonight we visit one of the CAF's wings. We're gonna take a trip to the Mississippi wing down near uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Now, before we get started, please do us a favor. I know a lot of you have already done it, but if you haven't done it yet, please take a second to like, share or subscribe and follow us. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, make sure you click the bell icon and you'll get notifications about new episodes of Warbird Tube when they go live. Now, as you're watching tonight, you may have some questions for our guest. If you do, just type them in the comments section. We'll try to answer them either during the presentation or before we sign off. So joining me now is Mississippi Wings leader, Jack Welch. Jack, welcome, and a uh, pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you. Good to be here with you. Well, you know, uh, Jack, and Jack and I talked about what, we would, what we'd be talking about during the uh, during webinar uh, about a week ago or so, but things have changed a little bit. Uh, you had a uh, uh, sort of a humanitarian mission that, that popped up uh, just, uh, just today. Tell us what the wing has been up to. Well, uh, I would I would guess you'd probably fall under the category of the Beatles song with a little help from our friends. Uh, I got a call yes, uh, Monday afternoon. One of my members posted on Facebook that they wanted to try to get some supplies and stuff to take to Rolling Fort, Mississippi, that just, just got struck by the tornado. And uh, he had family from up that way and was going to collect some stuff, at, independent of the wing. And uh, I said, Brandon, just do it at the hangar. We got place, we got room, bring it out there. Probably 25 minutes after I did that, Steve Fryman, who did not know we were having this conversation, separate thing from the Indiana wing, uh, sent a message to me on Facebook and said, would y'all be interested in some humanitarian stuff that could be delivered to y'all or do y'all have a place? I said, actually, one of my members is from up there. We just had this conversation 20 minutes ago. You must be listening in on top of us. Uh, they, at from two o'clock, to 10 o'clock this morning, raised $1,300 and bought $1,800 worth of supplies at Pensacola, where they were at coming here, loaded uh, the beach plane that you see there, as well as Diamond Lil, and flew them in to got into Jackson this morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, we unloaded 1,800 pounds of toilet paper, water, uh, wipes. Uh, they even bought some medicine, Tylenol, and everything like that. And uh, everything, there's a list, you see a picture there. We had some volunteers from the street department for the city of Pearl, which is out where the airport's located. A friend of ours was there and he sent a, he sent a work crew over that helped us move, move everything from the planes in and stack it in. And you see some of the stuff that was brought into, uh, as I told you earlier, you know, water weighs eight pounds to the gallon. So we get it on an airplane, because I was like, like how many, how much was the consumption? How much uh, room do y'all have on here? And then you, I think the beach had like 800 pounds. I said, well, let me tell you, water's heavy. You might want to put toilet paper on that one uh, <laughs> with it. But they brought, I, um, the, they brought food. They brought stuff even in on the T-34. They had bottles of water oh, and wow. toilet paper stuffed behind the pilot on that one. So they brought it in on all three of them uh, with everything on that. So. Well, and, and and for folks who don't know, and I'm going to back up here because that airplane, the uh, SNB, was actually part of the Mississippi wing uh, before it uh, made a couple of jumps and ended up in uh, in Indiana and on tour with the uh, with the B-24. Yes, it was. It was here for 20 years. Our wing celebrates its 40th. Y'all hang on, my power just went down, so I'm kind of uh -oh. moving around doing that. Um, <laughs> it is live. Um, the um, it's been here. It was here for 20 years, and then. Uh, was transferred back to headquarters because we had an absence of pilots that were trained to be able to fly the airplane. Uh, so um, within that within that mode, um, the airplane got transferred away. We had an A-10 uh, Franklin for about another 10 years that never really flew. And then recently we've gotten into having an L-5 and a PT-19. But we were real glad. Uh, the Indiana wing, who's where it's at, housed that now, calls the plane Bob which is really funny uh, <laughs> within all of that. So uh, Bob came home and Bob bought us a bunch of stuff and we were very thrilled to see it uh, come here and be here and everything like that. They had also been here on February the 14th. Uh, got that all hooked up. Um, they had been here on February 14th 
uh, to do the air power tour through right. town. So we had seen the plane had been here for that too. So we were really excited about that. Well, it, it's just, it, it's, it's amazing because this, this humanitarian thread uh, that, that you're, you're uh, been involved in today also goes through the, the history of the CAF. I mean, the, um, one of the very, very early air shows was canceled, I think in 61 or 62, because there was a hurricane in the Gulf and uh, the, uh, they loaded up all the airplanes from Harlingen and flew them over to, to where the hurricane was to bring us relief supplies. So they canceled the air show that year to do that. So that's something that, you know, CAF uh, and CAF members have been doing uh, not only through the wings, but also on their own uh, for years. So uh, we just wanted to point that out tonight. I mean, it yep. was just topical and, and, you know, our hearts go out to the folks in, in Mississippi. Have Thank seen you. The devastation and, and, you know, more storms might be coming at the end of the week, but hopefully. We, we had another round of storms two yeah. days later. Uh, and I want to thank the Indiana wing and the people from Indiana, their members uh, yeah. generated that funds from within themselves and their wing on that. So I think you see a picture there flashed in front of the screen right now of all of them there with uh, some of the people from the city works department there too. Awesome. Awesome. So thank you so very much for, uh, for being the, the hub of all of this. It's, it's amazing how, uh, how things can come together so quickly and, and you can have uh, hopefully a, a big impact on the, the folks that uh, really need some help right now. Yes. All right. All right. Well, let's get into the, the meat of, of what we're going to talk about tonight. And one of the things that um, I talked to Jack about and is that the Mississippi wing uh, may not be one of the wings that's flying airplanes all over the country and touring. They, they've got a couple of airplanes. We'll talk about those later. But when I check in on their Facebook page, there's always something going on and it's always fun and it looks like everyone is so engaged. So what I wanted to do tonight was Jack, have you tell us about some of the events that, that you've put together and, and maybe uh, some insights on, on how they came to be and, and really uh, kind of uh, give uh, folks there uh, maybe some inspiration to try some new things at, at their wing. But first off, how did you get involved in, in the CAF? Um, in 2011, there was an air show here in Jackson uh, and the CAF happened to have a happened to have a um, booth out there, and Tora 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 actually did it. That was the closest. That's the first time I'd ever seen Tora Tora Tora, and it was really close. And it was a small airport here in town. You could feel the heat coming off the uh, cough. And and I just was with. And I'm a history major, uh, and I was just just overwhelmed with it because you got the feeling of and of being there and and i'm a flying tiger fan and a p40 fan and they had a p40 there uh you know with there and it's just i told my wife i said you know you get the feeling of, and we've been to pearl harbor before i said and you get the feeling of what it must have been like at ford island that morning trying to get planes up trying to get planes down and all that all the chaos going on that morning with stuff blowing and everything like that so and it's just amazing the cutting in and out that the airplanes were doing and everything like that and you just got that genuine feel of what it must have felt like that morning uh so i kind of got that was when i i'd known about i grew up near barksdale air force base uh -huh. and so i was kind of familiar a little bit every now and then you'd see caf there back in the day uh it, it shows and stuff but like i said that was the first introduction here in mississippi to it uh i was involved doing some nonprofit work uh chairman of the board of an animal shelter and some other things i really didn't have any free time and 20, about 14 or 15, I joined the CAF nationally, just picked up on a website, sent it, sent some money, joined for two years, you know, my involvement with the CAF involved in getting the monthly dispatch. And that, that was it uh, from there. Um, and then uh, when I got involved with the local wing here about a year into it, uh, they asked me to be the uh, operations officer. And at that time, we didn't have an airplane that flew, so it's kind of easy to be operations off when you got anything to do. So they're like, come up with something. Uh, so we did Wine and Warbirds was the first event that I came up with, which just involved taking um, uh, a bottle of wine, food that matched with it, a story from the area where that wine came from, and then telling that story and charging people money to come uh, with it. And so... Uh, people actually paid game. <laughs> so uh, we wound up, we had, we figured we could do about 60 people. And I think we squeezed 70 people into the hangar uh, to do that from there. Great. Uh, you do have a hangar there. Uh, uh, approximately how big is the, is the hangar? Uh, uh, that, that I know. That's one of the few stats <laughs> I do know. It is a 5,000 square foot hangar. Uh, okay. We have uh, 202s there that are op 202s from Vietnam War era that one, two of our, our friends have. Uh, we've got P a PT-19 and an L-5 that's the wings. Oh, we've got a T-6 Texan in there. There is an L-2 that's been modified with the wings shortened. Uh, couple a couple of uh, 
I don't know what the other planes are. They're new, they're newer airplanes. Oh, uh, okay. One thing I'm not is a pilot or anything like that. So you know, as I was telling Steve earlier, I said, look, it has wings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. And uh, you made it a family affair. It's, uh, it's, I saw this picture and I said, wow, you got to include that. <laughs> and, and, and along the way, uh, when I came in and took over his operations, uh, I want to talk about this little picture that you got right there, if you don't mind, because it's sure. a funny little story. Um, the, we had met uh, we had met some people traveling. We're members of the World War II Museum. We go down pretty regular for things. Had met some people down there. Uh, one of the things I had heard about, shout out to Air Base Georgia, was their Heritage Days Festival that they used to do in September. Well, one year they honored the uh, Flying Tigers, and I'm a Flying Tiger fan, fanatic, actually. You can see the stuff behind me here in, here in my office. And uh, we went over because uh, they were honoring the Flying Tigers that year. And uh, one of the people there was Dick Cole, and that's who you see in the picture with Nancy and I. And the funny little story on that is is we Dick and them were staying in the same uh, hotel we were staying in the last morning on our way out. My wife saw him and his uh, daughter Cindy sitting in, in the hotel eating that morning. She said, you want to speak to them? And sometimes my wife's more aggressive about things than I am. And I says, oh, I don't want to bother me. But she goes, no, come on. You know, I mean, come on. The man's, you know, nearly 100. It was right at 100 then. Yeah. She goes, you may not get another chance. I said, that's a good point. So uh, we went in, introduced ourselves real quick, and kind of got to talking to Cindy. Uh, somehow over the course of time, I got Cindy's telephone number. And uh, now the state of Mississippi does an event called Trail of Honor here where they honor vets and they do it at one local Harley shop. And they'd been trying for a decade to get Dick Cole to come. And on Thanksgiving, one year, 2018, I believe it was, or 2017, I just got up Thanksgiving morning, sent Cindy a note and said, hey, you know, if your dad's, if y'all happen to be passing through here, whatever, you know, we'd love to have you, we'd love to have your dad out to our wing. Uh, have him, if he comes in on a Tuesday, we'll do something. If it's Tuesday at lunch, I'll find somebody and we'll do something. We'll have some people. We'd just love to have him come by. It'd be neat if he, if he had. Didn't hear from her. This was in November. Way over in March, I get this message from her. I'm real slow about responding to text messages and stuff like that. And I said, okay. She said, well, and she said, and dad, when you have something at dad's age, she said, if you tell him that in Thanksgiving, when it's cold in Texas, where they were at, uh, about it, he'll say, well, it's going to be freezing in Mississippi in May. I don't want to go out there and be cold. And she said, but we run into the same thing in the summertime. He thinks that the winter's going to be, you know, just he's just at that point in his life. And uh, she said, well, now it's March. And she said he's gotten asked again and come to find out the governor of the state of Mississippi had asked for 10 years in a row under three different administrations to get cold to come in for this thing. And he would come up with a reason not to come. And she said, he'll come this year, provided he can come out to y'all's hangar. I said, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. She said, but he wants to come see y'all. <laughs> He's like, he doesn't really care about the other stuff, but he'll come. So he came, he came in and we had him for the afternoon uh, for it. And the guy that put on the other event, he goes, I've been trying for a decade to get these. What'd you do? I said, and we met him and took his pictures with him in a hotel in Georgia. And I sent him a couple of texts to his daughter, <laughs> you know, kind of like not really big deal. But come to find out he had never been to Mississippi. And that was the first trip he had. to. He came, he spoke. It was very entertaining, very engaging at 100 years old. And yeah. uh, really cool event, really cool person. He certainly was a one of a kind. And, uh, we're, of you know, it, that uh, the CAF wings on your, your shirt might not have helped, uh, might have helped as well, because he's he's been a long time supporter or yeah. was a long time supporter of CAF. And, and yep. that was his deal. He wanted to come see our CAF hangar. And that was Excellent. one of the things with it. So, <laughs> well, let's get into the uh, the most recent, uh, I guess, ev event that you held. It's the uh, it's the uh, Amash uh, party. And uh, you also brought in the uh, Bayou State Escadrille. Yes. To, uh, to bring the uh, Bell 47 up. So yeah. how did how did this all come about? Well, um, the event itself came about because about the time I took over, thinking I was development director, we, we merged in and did development education office together because I had a background in development, doing fundraising. They wanted me to do that. Uh, I wanted to do education. I said, I'll do both. I'd rather do both because to me, education drives development. If you don't educate people, they're not going to give you any money. You know, that kind of, and a lot of times if you tell people about something, they want to give you money. So I said, you know, they kind of work hand in hand with that. So we made that pitch to headquarters and somebody there agreed and said, okay, that works. <laughs> so they agreed to do it. Well, the next bind we had was it was about time to send out membership dues and get people to renew. And we had gone from, I haven't, 
nothing going on in November, like October. So we had this big gap from October all the way to March when six months out of the year really wasn't anything going on. I said, why don't we do a mash party, do it at the hangar and do it in January uh, with it. And everybody was like, okay, what's a mash party? I said, well, everybody, I said, I'm stealing this from my college years from when I was in college because my fraternity did a mash party. I said, everybody dresses up like mash. We make jungle juice or something like that. And, you know, if we want to do it, just however farther y'all want to take it. Uh, there you go. <laughs> still, still becomes present. So uh, the, uh, I said, yeah, we can, we can do that. We, you know, the first thing everybody says, now this is Mississippi, and they're like, well, you know, it's cold, huh, at the hangar. I said, well, it was cold in Korea, remember? So I said, put some clothes on and come on. Obviously, you see Dale there in his bathrobe uh, on a 30-degree morning uh, that we were doing this. But we put up tents inside the hangar. We have a, a swamp tent. Uh, that one there is the swamp you're looking at, and that was the swamp you see the steel there to the right. Uh, we've also got a nurse's tent that we have the 99s ladies flying group comes in and they we invite them in and they do that um we have a, usually an officer whoever's wing leader gets stuck with having to put that tent together uh on that uh and then we have fried catfish which you know that's a good hot food that you can eat during the winter and we do that we've had uh duets come in and sing we've had musical groups come in and sing this past year we had um a local doctor here, local, he's an hour and a half away in Greenwood, uh, wrote a book several years ago and presented it at a at a medical conference. You can see the uh, there's our surgery tent uh, presented it at a medical conference. And one of our members wives uh, heard it and told us this guy's really great. You need to get him. So I said, well, if you'll make the arrangements and get him, we'll get him to come. So he came in and spoke. And it's the connection between MASH and that's the officer's tent. I mean, uh, the headquarters tent um the connection between mash and mississippi through the book the movie and the television show and there, and he and he paints a picture of how this was done and what the connection was of real people that listed and that there is no hawkeye hawkeye's an assimilation of several people uh with that some of the other major winchester winds up being there actually was it was a thoracic surgeon uh, Trapper John, there was actually, they asked to get a chest cutter. He has, he identifies who this is. There was no, uh, the MASH unit, their designation, that unit did not exist, but several other units you hear routinely mentioned on the show, those are real units. So with that, he got a pinpoint kind of of where this base would typically have been located at. So it's a neat store. It kind of gets people into it. Um, with it a lot of times people kind of come and go okay and then they get into it and they just you see people just kind of get sucked in to hearing him tell and of course we have clinger you can't have anything without clinger uh on that actually the guy that's playing clinger played macarthur the year before now that's a contrast <laughs> <laughs> he did a really good job too <laughs> that's dave zavozo one of our members i think there's somebody you know in that picture too right there by me <laughs> Rosenbeck came in. You know, we were glad to have her there. And that's Rick Bell. A lot of people know Rick. Yep. Rick makes a good Winchester. <laughs> he actually put him to work. Yeah, put him to work. <laughs> uh, this was actually kind of funny. I have to tell this story. They uh let me see if I can remember what's going on in here. They've got a flight suit, they've got the headgear over the top of it where you can't see it. They took an air mask off it. Uh, one off another exhibit we had aviation mask and put that over it and they've actually got it hooked up to a fire suppressant thing in the back so it's just a combination if you know what you're looking at it's a scream <laughs> you know <laughs> with it so uh, and that's actually great. one of our members that light you see up in the upper right hand everybody has a white elephant we have a surgical lamp that is good for this one time a year for two hours <laughs> with it. other than that it just gets in the way all the time <laughs> that's amazing and, and again you, you mentioned the the presentation i mean it, it, it it's fun it brings the wing together brings people from outside but again the educational element that goes with it really really makes it stand out and again supports the CAF mission. Yeah, uh, we charge $15 to come. It covers the mm -hmm. cost of the food. Uh, it is when we renew memberships to local memberships. We encourage our members to bring a guest. We tell them if you bring your guest, we'll, the wing will cover their food. Don't worry about it. Get them to come. We usually do fried catfish because like I said, that's something we can get and come and come in and do and about $15 a plate. And it's all you can eat and stuff like that. And that's something good to serve on a cold day's hot catfish. 
Uh, and we've this is our L5, which is an air ambulance. So this past year, that made for a great addition to the to the show or to the event. And yes, we know there were no L5s flown during that time. But now the uh, Louisiana wing came down yeah. and they were going to bring their helicopter. But because of the weather, they weren't able to. We're hoping they'll be able to bring it next year for it uh, with it. But it made great issues with pictures because we were going to fly rides and do some stuff with them. But bless their hearts, it, when they couldn't come, they still sent 12 people. So they had oh, a my. good large contingent. So it, it was really good mix. And we made some good camaraderie and some great new friends. And actually, some of, my, some of their people joined our wing and some of our people joined one theirs and one of my pilots is also one of their pilots now uh, so that's <laughs> what's been, the, he was a chopper pilot and had been wanting to get involved in a chopper and he said this is great ah awesome what's what's the diff distance between the the two the two um, units? we're about three and a half hours three okay. hours something like that all right so that was a significant you know, um, investment for them to, to drive up yeah, to. Yeah, uh, and, and we've got um, a number of, we've got a couple of members that come up from the coast that come up here. Three, we're kind of about three hours away from Memphis, mm -hmm. Birmingham, a couple of different places. And we've got to where we've started a partnership kind of doing some things with the Birmingham Escadrille. Uh, we've done some things with uh, Four Bama. Has, has their leader Tony has flown up in his airplane for our show. Uh, the New Orleans, both both groups in New Orleans, have both have been up for events and shared aircraft and stuff like that. Oh, awesome! Good to good to see the uh, interunit cooperation. Yes, and of course you uh, also, uh, as many uh, units do, you have a hangar dance. But uh, have a hangar this dance. One looks, this one looks like fun. That started out. Uh, one, two of our two of our older members, or more mature. I don't like the word older. I always say <laughs> more mature. Uh, two of our more mature members came to me and said, "Okay, you've done this wine and warbirds event where you match this wine up and everything like that. But is there a reason why we couldn't do a hanger dance like we used to do back in the old days?" I said, "Well, part of the problem is I wasn't there, so I don't know what. Tell me." tell me about the event and they said well we'd have a band we'd have a stage band come and play and we play play 40s music and that was it i said so they just came played music and that was it i said okay i said okay we got to figure out a way to make some money off this deal so we actually found this band it's an all-volunteer band it's 20 people uh with it it's a mississippi big big swing band uh got them we i'll, I'll throw some numbers at you just kind of let people kind of know we give them a thousand dollars to um to the band and then whatever tips that they can get that day we have a, several dance clubs that we go to you see the guy there in the middle he's one of the dance instructors at one of the clubs we go in and recruit their members about a third of the people that come are our members about a third of the people are their dance club members and a third we have no idea where they came from uh so and that to me is a good event when you go in with partnership you want to we want to use some of your members and their money, but we'd also like to bring some people that might want to join the dance club, maybe want to join us. So, and that, that's been our goal all along. It's been to encourage, encourage more people to get involved and come out uh, with it and everything. We clean the hangar out, uh, move the airplanes outside, set the food up. You can see behind the group on the left-hand side, you can see a little table back there. That's where we have round tables. We Now our event, uh, our hangar will hold 5,000, uh, square feet we can do about 120 so we average 120 130 plus 20 people live in the band with that so do you have a lot of people uh, that uh, do you do um dance lessons before the band starts before the official yeah, uh, we starts? start the event we start the event at six and at 6 30 uh the guy comes out and does uh and, and and i'm pulling my head for what his name is uh with it um comes out at 6 30 and does dance lessons for about 30 minutes he's a really great dancer uh and, and even if you don't dance i tell people if you don't dance it's great to watch the music is great the the orchestra that comes and performs the guy that's the maestro from it he explains every song tells you the history about it and everything opens it up uh the one i, I always remember the classic one i always tell is uh he talked about a song that was uh named somebody in the 30s that sang it uh, Frank Sinatra sang it, uh, somebody else sang the song, and they started playing, and it was, I'm just a gigolo, that Van Halen <laughs> song, which I thought was a Van Halen song. And I'm like, really? I said, my God, that song was pretty risque for 1930, 1940. Yep. You know, when you start listening to the words, kind of like, ooh, grandma and grandpa are a little bit on the wild side there. <laughs> And there's a number of songs there you hear, and you can see there are pictures that we've taken, uh, the uh, different people there with it, and people dress up in their 40s attire with it, which makes it a lot of fun. 
Yeah, you were, you were saying earlier that uh, you were you were hoping a, a few people would would dress up for the. Yeah, for the first the... year we did it, we thought if we can get sixty people, we'll be happy uh, with it. We wound up with a hundred. Uh, we thought if we could get ten to dress up, that would be an accomplishment. We had eighty out of a hundred people dressed. If you did, one of the funniest stories is one of the guys in the wing. His son's was 15 or 16 at the time and his dad had told him said you ought to borrow my military uniform and wear it he had navy whites and he said you could wear that with it because he was an officer and wear that and look and look good and uh he said no i'm not gonna yeah i'm too cool for school he got there and the first thing he did was run into our wing leader who was in just a standard sailor's outfit you know that he had purchased some place and he told his daddy he goes your suit looks better than that Can we run back to the house so he went back to the house and changed and came back so we've had a lot of stories of people that came there and said oh i can do that uh with everything y'all got y'all stole some good pictures from me here <laughs> there's your band leader yeah yeah david david that's david uh they usually have a, a lady that that sings and she sings uh she sings each year with it and a lot of it's just music but they do sing probably about half the songs you know so aside from being a, a again a fun event this is another, another fundraiser for the unit yeah we, we usually make a thousand i think this past year we actually raised twenty five hundred dollars off of it uh we consider it a social it's our gift back to the community and that's kind of how we back, phrase it when we put it together i said we're not trying to really make any money but i always think we should so we've always tried to raise around a thousand again we make enough we charge enough in the ticket price uh tickets are 25 dollars each now this is the funny story about this event uh the tickets are 25 dollars each there's a table of six, six to 25. What's that? 150. We charge $200 a table. And people always go, that math don't add up. I said, it's a fundraiser. And then exactly. and people go, well, I'll just buy tickets and I'll sit by my friends. No, you won't because we'll spread you all around the building so you won't even be near each other. So if you <laughs> want to sit with your friends, you need to pay us $200. <laughs> and the first couple of years that got it, and now everybody's like, I want the $200 table. They don't even ask about the end. This past year, no, we sold very few individual tickets. And mostly that's last minute people that couldn't find a fifth or sixth person sure. uh, with that. So. And we have, we talked about wine and warbirds. Um, now, I think in, in our previous conversations, this this kind of went on hiatus with uh, with COVID, right? It went on hiatus with COVID. We did it for about four years. Uh, we did it the first year. Like I said, it was the very first event we started doing as far as a special event. And we matched a wine with the area of the country over there with a story about, you know, something that happened there with it and a food that went with it. And we had a caterer. Our caterer, unfortunately, got cancer and passed away just before uh, she actually did the last one. They had chemo that morning and came out and did the food, did an excellent job. Uh, she actually taught taught culinary skills uh, with that. And with that and with COVID, and it got hard to get the food and get the wine and get it all matched up. So um, in doing fundraising, one of the things I've learned is sometimes you just need to let something die. And so we just have let that event just kind of sunset it as, as the new word I hear everybody using. So we kind of have sunsetted the event. We The plan is to bring it back. But like I said, the main thing is trying to match that wine up. And Mississippi has an interesting alcohol rules, which I won't get into uh, about that, but it makes it a little unique in trying to do the event. Well, it, it, but it was a, a unique uh, idea, you know, with the pairing yes. wine, you know, and then well, tying that into World War II. And, yeah. A lot of people ask me, and I'll get into what the unique thing is. A lot of people said, oh, well, y'all need to do uh, hops and props, do hops and props. I said, well, we have a little problem. We're located 300 feet from a Baptist church and 600 feet from a Methodist church. The Methodists don't have any problem, but the Baptists do. In the state of Mississippi, beer it, let me get these straight how they do this hard stuff liquor wine and stuff like that is sold by the state and distributed independently so if you want a license to do that you can you can actually sell that closer to a baptist church than you can beer they don't want beer there so it winds up being it's easier for us to do that uh, wine and warbird which is a more upscale event and we can charge more money so you know because it's a more more upscale event with it so it's, yeah. it's been kind of funny uh with, with all of that so that's just that's kind of where we wound up being and if you buy the other if you do do beer and you can be able to do anything then you have to pay income taxes on everything you raise because that gets involved instead of the abc being involved like the 
alcohol. And the other one involves the, IR, the Mississippi Bureau of Revenue. So we would rather deal with the alcohol and tobacco boys over here than we would deal with the IRS. I, I think most people can relate to that. <laughs> I think so. Yep. But it, it is a, a good uh, lesson to, uh, you know, when, when someone says, oh, you should do a hops and props and you run into a couple of roadblocks and you found a way around it, which was even a more creative and, and more lucrative uh, fundraiser for, for the wine. Yeah, and we've we've talked about and we, we've explored doing and we'll probably like to do something maybe with vodka because there's a vodka company here in town that's making and bottling vodka. So uh, the craft beer industry is mostly on the Gulf Coast here uh, with that. Uh, but, you know, there is a vodka. We've talked about maybe doing some, doing a joint venture and they're interested in doing that. So that's when we sunsetted the wine in Warbirds. We're probably going to bring it back in some shape, shape or form of a, a vodka type event. Awesome. Awesome. And then there's this one. Hanger, the hanger, hanger hangover. <laughs> Tell us about it. <laughs> the hanger hangover started when I used to do fundraising for an animal shelter. And I was chairman of the board there. And we had a car club that would come in on their own accord, do the money and write us a check. And that was it. It was we didn't have to do anything except go down, show up, and pick up the check. Um, when I started working with the commemorative Air Force, one of the guys that did that got wind of it, got in contact with me. And he said, hey, I've got a friend, Roddy, who produces car shows who would like to talk to you about renting y'all's hangar. And at the time we did rent the hangar. So he came. It was January. It was cold as all get out. I think it was a week after the mash party. He came out and we walked around and looked at it. And he told me and we charge eight hundred dollars to rent the hangar. I will put that out there uh, with it. So and I told him, he said, I want to rent your hangar and do it. And I said, don't want to do that. Don't want to rent it to you. And he goes, was there a problem? I said, well, yeah, there is a problem. I said, the problem is I want you to come here and do a car show here where I can get more people into the hangar that butts through the door uh, with it per se. And I said, I'd rather do something. And I knew we had a, a situation where we were doing a flyover later in the year at 4th of July, and we're going to have a bunch of airplanes in to help out with that. I said, I'll have four or five different airplanes, some T6s and different planes like that. I said, if y'all do that, then I could provide the airplanes. I'll provide the space. There's no charge at that point for you because you will do this as a cooperative venture. If you'll get the car guys there, I'll get the airplane guys there and provide a place. And he's also really good with social media. So he turned, I mean, the volume up wide open on it. So uh, with a lot of pushing and stuff like that with it and put, posting it out and everything like that. So the first year we had about 400 people. The next year we had 800 people, 1,200 people, and over 1,500, 1,600. Now, now it's 500 the first year. The first year we did it was when COVID hit. The state of Mississippi opened up on Memorial Day weekend, and we were doing this on the 15th. So we had 500 people show up when all the world thinks it's going to get COVID. And people were asking us, well, aren't y'all scared? I said, no, you open the hangar door. It's an outside event. You can't get COVID when you're outside. Sorry, can't get it. Uh, this is Southern. This is the way we do things in the South. Uh, with it. I said, you can't get COVID. So we opened it up, spaced the cars out, got everybody out, and just had, because nothing had been going on for three months, and all of a sudden you throw a party, you tell everybody to come, everybody came. So we got a big crowd. Even the even the chief of police in the city was like, how did y'all get that many people out? I said, mm, we sent a permit, so we were permitted to do it, but they didn't read the permit because nobody could believe anybody would try to plan a event two weeks after the end of COVID. <laughs> and I said, well, we invited pilots and our people on our page they invited people on their page and we they said y'all put no posters up nope did y'all put anything in the newspaper nope did you put anything on radio nope nope everything was on facebook i go i guess we missed it i said i guess y'all need to friend our pages there huh <laughs> <laughs> our new friends with the police department <laughs> So but we don't charge for the event and that was the key to doing that because i really just wanted to draw people into the hangar what we do is when people come in, we tell them this is a free event. It's open to the public. And we do this for our aviation open house that we do in May, do the same thing. It's free. It's open. Public. If you would like to make a donation, you can. And when people came in, saw what the, and we stuffed the, boxes the tubes that we use to collect money we stuff them where people can see it with 20s and 10s and fives and people get that idea we're not looking for one dollar bills uh here so a lot of fives and tens and twenties and you know making five six eight hundred dollars through the door and then we do a silent auction and some other stuff uh rent out some uh, vendor space we've had some vendors come out and do it and we've grown from 80 cars to over 120 we went from 10 airplanes to 20 airplanes 
Wow. With it. Now, this particular event, we open it up a little bit more. Generally, for our op aviation open house, I focus on World War II and earlier airplanes. Uh, we've had crop dusters. We've had bush planes. We've had all kinds. If, if it flies, we even had a balloon come out. And uh, there was a glider club wanted to bring a glider. If it flies and it'll match, uh, we had a little micro helicopter that looked like a James Bond, and we put a Lamborghini on one side of it and a Ferrari on the other. Uh, this car show draws Lamborghinis, Ferraris, uh, Porsches, Mustangs, Camaros. Uh, the winners this past year were two Packards. Uh, wow. with it. it is a very high class. Uh, the guy does a really great job of drawing everybody in. So, and that's a really tight little community that knows everybody. Yeah. Now, it, it, when you say car show, is it? it are there uh, prizes? Is there judging, or well, is it just uh, more? He of charges. A general... What what he does with it? Uh, we. We move all the airplanes out of the hangar, and again, I turn that part over to him. He charges them X amount of dollars to be inside the hangar, and of course, mm -hmm. in Mississippi, in any time of the summer, anything all the way through September, everybody wants to be inside. So those those prices go quick, and then we wedge all the other cars in out. Before we had some outside the hangar, we now move everything inside our inside the fence on the aprons around the airport. Uh, we've gotten better airport management now, and they've been real helpful with helping. Yeah, just whatever y'all need to do, they'll come in, cut the grass, get it low. We get a lot of cooperation from the city and stuff like that to, to make it where it's a fun event. Yeah, awesome. And again, there's two churches across the street, so people can park over there and walk over, free parking. We don't charge for parking. There you go. Well, we mentioned at the uh, top of the show, you've got uh, two aircraft that are assigned to the uh, to the unit. Yes. The, uh, L, the L5 and mm -hmm. uh, doctor's orders. Uh, tell us a little bit, uh, what's the backstory on, on this airplane? Um, I'm going to reverse this out, if you don't mind. Uh, the <laughs> PT-19 was the oh, one. Okay. When I came into the wing, if you've got a picture there of that, give me a minute. Okay. Yeah. Um, when I came to the wing, we had a Franklin, an A-10. Uh, they had just decided to sell it. It was sold. It was gone uh, with it. So when I took over as wing leader, we had no airplane. I'm like, well, this is great. Uh, the former wing leader on the way out was trying to get this plane here, this PT-19 that Colonel Bob Dunn had in Nacogdoches, Texas. Mm -hmm. so a lot of people recognize that plane and know that number on the front end of it. So uh, Bob passed away. His widow wound up selling us the airplane, and we got the airplane in May of COVID. So it was, COVID was in 20, and so we got it in May of 20. Yeah. Uh, came into the wing. We it had been in a barn for about three or four years, and so we refurbished and got it, got it together. Uh, I don't know if we got enough time, I'll tell a funny story about Bob and that airplane. Uh, we got uh, things kind of went around. Our guys started working on it, trying to get it, uh, giving its annual inspection, checking to make sure everything was all clear. We well, came up on Christmas time of that year. There was an L5 doctor's orders that had been parked in our hangar prior to the PT-19 coming in. Uh, one of our members uh, had that plane and uh, had left it there for an event and just didn't have any room at his hangar. And so we were kind of like, Dan's brought his planes over for a number of events. So we just, I said, just leave it there. It's not taking up any space. So story we tell everybody is Christmas that year fell on a Monday. Uh, we always tell everybody that we woke up on Christmas morning and there was a uh, an airplane in our hangar. Uh, my family's a long line of storytellers and we believe uh, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. So I did embellish <laughs> part of that there uh, with it. Uh, it's been a great addition. It's actually the airplane when we looked at the PT-19. I really wanted us to try to acquire this airplane, but it was not, we just didn't have the finances to be able to do it. So we actually walked away at the end of my first year as wing leader with a double win. I got, everybody got a plane they wanted. A lot of them wanted open air and I'm not wasn't a big open air fan. Uh, I like the closed plane and I like that particular plane. I like the story behind it. It's an air ambulance and stuff like that. And I thought that was cool. So, yeah. Well, you said you had a, a story about uh, Bob and the. All uh, right. Now, this, this, was, this, was, this one's funny. Uh, we <laughs> went over in May to go pick the airplane up. And uh, when we went over to get it, part of the agreement with getting the airplane was at the local TV stations in Nacogdoches, Texas, where Bob actually owned several of the stations and was actually involved with the media over there. The family wanted them to TV stations to come out, cover, you know, plane flies back home to the east, you know, that kind of thing like that. Well, one of my members, Carl Holcomb, uh, was the one that went over. The four four guys flew over. Carl was going to fly the plane back because he had experience. He was ready to fly the plane back. So he he went over, got in. It just he says, just as I'm getting ready to get in the airplane, get started. He said, his uh, daughter comes out and she's got something in her hands and she comes up and she's got ashes 
it was ashes from her dad. And she said one of the things that he wanted was to have those ashes spread, you know, over the Sabine Pass, which is between Louisiana and Texas. And uh, he said, well, yeah, I'm a crop, and he's a crop duster. Uh, Carl's a crop duster. He said, well, I figured, you know, I can do that. You know, what's what's the big deal? So he said, get in the plane, stuff it down in the airplane. He said, I'm flying along, get to Sabine Pass and realize, oh, hey, I'm supposed to put this stuff out. And he said, I'm a crop duster. I should have known better. And he said, unscrew it, get it, and you know what happens next. You know, we like to know that Bob is there with us in spirit, there with it. Uh, other story is if wing leader on there, sometimes you get a little bit of extra shoot to get to do stuff. And I told him, I said, we're not taking that name off that airplane. And we yeah. get asked a lot about taking his name. I said, no, that people see that plane. They know that was his. And that's not that's not coming off of there uh, with, within all that. So we've been very excited. We're very thankful to their family uh, for, for giving that. And and I tell that story sounds we're being disrespectful. His remains. And I'm, again, I'm embellishing a little bit with that story. But that's pretty much kind of the way that went down within everything. But uh, we are very thankful to have that airplane and what it means to us. And it's, yeah. and it's, it's a lot of flight time. Yeah. So are, are both the uh, airplanes available for uh, for rides? They are. We just got them in the rides program. We got both of them. That was our 2023 goal. And we started the year with both of them in the rides program. Uh, we rent both of them out for $150 for a 22 minute flight uh, with that. And yes, we've been told we're a little bit cheaper than some other people about what they charge on theirs. But, you know, we're, we're here and they're not uh, <clears throat> with everything. So uh, we're, we're, we're really excited. We're trying to get people in and make that focus, you know, get people interested in aviation. Great. How many uh, how many pilots do you have for for each airplane? Do you know offhand? Yes, I do. Um, I, basically, they do double dip on both okay. planes. I've got three. I've got three right now. We've got a couple in training and trying to bring some more more on pilot sponsors. I think I have about seven or eight, but some of them haven't rated out or decided what they want to do or anything like that. Okay. Are you planning on going to um, air shows around the around the region with these? We have been. We've been to. Uh, we've taken the L5. Has been to an air show in Louisville, Louisville, Mississippi. Uh, we did one in Columbus, Mississippi last year. We've done a couple of air shows here locally. We're trying to do some stuff with the other wings here in the area. Uh, with it, uh, our planes are going to be in Monroe, Louisiana, May 4th, 5th, and 6th. Let me get that in, that plug in for the Red, White, and Blue Air Show uh, tied in with the Chenault Museum. Uh, go Flying Tigers uh, with that. So that, that'll be going on there. We've got some other things that we're trying to do and get get the planes involved in. And if anybody has an air show or has something, if they'll give us a call, we'll definitely entertain offers. Excellent, excellent. And uh, one here, this is, uh, I think this is from one of your open houses? This this one is actually from the Louisville, Mississippi uh, air show there. Okay. Uh, we went up, took our L5 and our PT-19. I think the yellow one back there behind you, I think that's our PT-19 you can see on the back side. Of, yeah, right there uh, yeah. with that. Uh, that's a TBM Avenger right there that a friend of the wings owns, John Mosley, uh, uh, okay. with that. And I was just telling some kids there but explaining that. One of the things that we do, and I, I know everybody does it because I got a whole stack of them over here. Uh, can't get my hands on them real quick. We do some hero cards. We have some information about the airplane. Uh, one of the things I found, and again, I'm not a pilot, and I find pilots sometimes can, and I know they're going to hate me say this, it can be hard to talk to uh, with that. And it's hard for kids yeah. kind of come up and interrupt them with stuff. So what we did was do pictures of each one of the airplanes and have them have the pilots. I thought I had some real here close. Uh, have the pilots we left some space in the bottom where they can sign their name, but their pictures on the front picture of the airplane, some information about the airplane, their name is on there and the name of what kind of plane it is. And the idea was to get kids to collect those cards okay. uh, with, with those. Uh, and it's kind of turned out to be kind of cool because we also did a card up for a wasp. The 99s helped mm -hmm. us out with a lot of stuff. So we did a couple of their uh, members up as wasp and got in front of our, one of our airplanes and did some stuff there with that. Uh, Wonder woman, you may not know, she is also a pilot. Pilot. She, yep. We have a hangar next to us, and we house her invisible airplane there. Uh, we've got <laughs> cards for that. We tell the kids, airplanes over there, top secret. You can look in, the, you can look in, but it's kind of hard to see when it's an invisible airplane. So we do have an invisible airplane located next to us. <laughs> That's awesome. And we have a card for her too, so it's cool. That's great, Jack. What are some of the things that are coming up this year for you? Anything, anything new, or we're going to kind of uh, keep building on your success? <laughs> 
And you should ask because I've got a list here of stuff. Coming up. It's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, we're, we've got a couple of educational meetings. We're doing one this Saturday on the X-15 plane and the pilots that flew them. Uh, Colonel Hallman is going to be speaking on that, Dr. Hallman's brother. Uh, we've got a young lady who uh, is a pilot in training, uh, flying, t flying the trainer planes, the naval trainer planes out of Meridian Naval Air Station where Hank Coates was at. Uh, yeah. Hank, wing leader, I mean, the uh, president of uh, the CAF was stationed at, and was actually base commander, not stationed, was base yeah. commander. She's flying. She's going to be doing a presentation on the 15th about the apparatus and everything like that that they use doing that. Uh, coming up in May, on the third Saturday in May, we have an aviation open house. Uh, we'll do hangar hangover the last Saturday in September. We do our hangar dance the first first or second. It's the first Saturday in November, November the 4th uh, on that. We kind of moved that around with Wings Over Dallas and stuff like that, but it's kind of found a home at the first weekend there. Uh, we're doing coming up here on April 29th. Uh, MASH Party has been a big success. So one of the things we're adding this year is Good Night Vietnam. That's a new event that we're doing. Uh, the band that plays at the hangar dance is going to merge down to just their brass section and their saxophones and stuff like that. And they're going to do, we're going to do a Good Night Vietnam theme like uh, Robin Williams thing. Yeah. We've got a food truck coming in for it. We've got uh, uh, local muscle car groups and cars that were big in the 60s and the 50s, the classic 50s cars come in, 32 deuces and stuff like that. Have a little small car show over on one side for the event. Just have a sock hop type dance out there, tie dyes and all that kind of stuff. But that, that's a new event we're doing. Well, we're just going to do it as a, um, as just a, let, let's do it. Let's do something because everybody keeps asking, why don't you do something for Vietnam and do something kind of for Vietnam veterans kind of thing. Uh, we're going to change it just a little bit. We're going to pivot because of the nature of what's going on in our world here. We're going to increase our ticket price from $10 to $25 and take that $15 and donate it towards uh, the relief efforts going on for the tornadoes here in the state yeah. of Mississippi and stuff like that. So that's that's kind of one of the things that we're looking at doing that and encourage people to bring in some more stuff that can be sent off up there. So we're going to do, little, little, do a little humanitarian stuff here in the spring uh, time. Yeah. So with all these things that are happening, obviously, uh, you and Nancy can't do all of it. How many members are, are in the wing? We've got about 45 or 50, wow. probably. Uh, probably okay. active group is about 18 or 20. Uh, one of the things, again, I've worked with volunteers before and other things, and I believe in rotation. So when we do an event, I've got three guys that come out. They move all the airplanes out of the hangar, and they're gone for the day. I've got another group that comes in, sweeps the hangar, sets up all the tables and the chairs, and they rotate out. Uh, Nancy's uh, persnickety about how she likes to set stuff up, so she's got one or two of her friends that come in, and they set stuff up. Uh, when the event's over with at the end, it's an all-call. Everybody helps us put up tables and chairs. Uh, we started out with just having a 5,000-foot brand-new hangar. Hanger. We now have 120. We've got 20 tables, eight long tables, 20 round tables, 120 chairs and stuff. So when a group comes in and rents it, everything's there. But it makes it easy for us to do an event. And we got roller carts so we can roll around and do that. So what we try to do is rotate people in where nobody feels they're overwhelmed uh, with everything. Um, I always tell everybody, if you buy a ticket to the event, you will not be asked to do anything during the event. So some of the members that go, well, I really can't afford to come or something like that. Great. You need to come and volunteer yeah. uh, during the event because, you know, we always need somebody to watch the bar, somebody to watch the silent auction, stuff like that. So, you know, just as long as you do your function that we've got you for, we can do that from there. And we're always actively trying to recruit and get more people in. So. Uh -huh. Awesome, awesome. Looks, it, there's so many things happening down there. It's it's uh, it's amazing that that's a, a that small of a group, uh, even 45 or 50 members. Uh, that you're doing, probably, you're having a lot of fun. Active, the active yeah. group with it's about 22, probably 22 to 23 of us. We've been trying to recruit and get more and more people, spouses involved too, because that just gives you an extra thing, and it's a little easier to do something with the spouses there than if they're not. So. That is that is very true. So uh, for folks who are are wondering, how do they keep up with the uh, all the all the great things that are happening in the in the wing. Uh, the best way we don't have we don't have a um, a web page. Uh, we just go with a Facebook page. Uh, it's uh, Miss, Mississippi Wing of the Commemorative Air Force. I think everybody else's page is Commemorative Air Force and them, but whoever set ours up did it the other did it the opposite way. So that's the way we are. It's Mississippi Wing of the Commemorative Air Force. Uh, they can also uh, email me. Um, at Jack dot Welch, W E L C H three little eyes. Cause I'm the third at gmail.com. 
uh, that they can email me and tell me, hey, I want to be a member. I want information. I won't get added to the mailing list. We'll put them on a mailing list. I just do one newsletter. I do it once a week. I mean, once a month. It's usually the Monday prior to the meeting, kind of going over kind of what's going on and give an updated list of upcoming events and things like that. We meet on the third Saturday of the month. That anybody that's out there that's close by wants to come by, we always meet on the third Saturday of the month. Sounds good. Any final thoughts before we uh, sign off tonight? Uh, no, just uh, I, we. I just encourage anybody that's not a pilot or a veteran or anything like that to get involved and do something. There's room for those for those of us uh, with that. Bob Lawrence, a good friend of mine from uh, up in Missouri, and that's one of the things that I was at a thing, and I was kind of like, I don't know if I fit in here at a CAF conference, and he said, you know, I'm administrative. You know, there's got to be a ground crew, and there's a sign that hangs up in our uh, in our hangar that I bought and hung up there that I got down from uh, it's Semper Time in New Orleans. It says, you know, it takes a good ground crew to keep a pilot in the air, or something to that effect. Yeah, so you got to have you got to have a ground crew. You got to have those people. And I know, and I know a couple of my pilot friends have asked me. They said, well, why don't you get your pilot's license? I said, I'm just really not interested in it. I said, I like what I do. This is where I fit in at doing and i think there's a lot of other people out there that are probably the same way that like the history end of it like the camaraderie like being around people and stuff like that and just ask i mean i think that's probably the biggest thing we don't do is ask people how hey, you want to join we make excuses for why they shouldn't join exactly Great thoughts tonight, Jack. I appreciate you taking some time to uh, to share your some of the events that that you're doing with the Mississippi Wing, and uh, your uh, your enthusiasm is infectious. So I just keep it up. I know there's a great success on the on the horizon for the Wing, and uh, please pass along our, our congratulations to everybody for uh, for a great year last year, and looking forward to seeing all the wonderful things you'll you'll come up with this year. Thank you. Thanks for having us today. And again, I want to thank the people of Indiana and the Indiana Wing for the Mercy Mission that they flew into Jackson today at 10 o'clock. We appreciate that very much. Yep. And uh, check out their uh, Facebook page and uh, you can get, keep up to date with not only all the events that are going on, but also their relief efforts. As uh, Jack mentioned, uh, later in April, they'll be doing a, uh, an event which will have a fundraiser uh, tied to it as well. So yep. um, just, just keep an eye on that Facebook page. All right. And uh, it's uh I see it's uh, facebook.com slash MSWingCAF. So that's the, that's the official, that's <laughs> that's the the official, official title. Um, if, if, they'll send an, if they'll send a thing, hey, I want to be a part of it, we'll be happy to hook them up to it. All right. Thanks, Jack. And thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, today. Don't forget to click that like, subscribe, or follow button so we can let you know about future shows. If you have any ideas for topics, we'd love to hear from you. Just uh, send Leah Block an email at media at CAFHQ.org. Again, thanks to uh, Jack and the Mississippi Wing for uh, for sharing their, their events with us tonight. And until next time, for the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night. <laughs>